All right, y'all, tomorrow is election day. In case you're new around here, I have been screaming about Donald Trump for four years and about this election for the last 12 months at least. I'm tired. I'm often preaching to the choir here, but I know that there are some of you who are still on the fence or who are planning on voting third party or who don't have a plan to vote and probably won't or who feel apathetic about voting or who still think, despite the leaders of the undecided movement and progressives the world over begging you to vote for Harris, that you simply cannot in good conscience vote for someone who hasn't fully condemned the genocide in Gaza and that's the single issue, the one hill you're willing to die on. For you, I have spent the last six months making video after video with facts and figures to try to reach you with reason and logic to explain why Trump is a fascist, the elements of Project 2025 that will be most devastating to you or the communities around you, why Jill Stein is not the protest vote you think it is, how moneyed interests are influencing the vote, how Christian nationalism is a threat to everyone's rights to live freely, how our electoral college works, why third party candidates aren't viable in our current system, and how all of our rights are at stake if Trump wins. I've seen numerous comments from people who have watched with an open mind or an open heart and who have genuinely been swayed by my presentation of the facts over these many, many months, or who have shown my videos to family members and those family members have had their hearts and minds opened to what could happen under a Trump presidency, enough to potentially sway their vote or to encourage them to vote at all. To those people, I say thank you. Thank you for being willing to have an open mind in a country where that is not easy. Today, we're discussing the very real, very human consequences of a second Trump presidency. If you're still unsure, if you're on the fence, if you're deciding whether to show up, I implore you to stick around. Let's get into it. Hate to break it to you, but it's fall and the holidays are somehow already right around the corner. Don't get me wrong, I love holiday food, but sometimes all the sugar and heavy meals makes me feel not great. And I just want a balanced, easy meal that includes actual literal vegetables once in a while and that I don't have to cook myself. Is that so much to ask? That's where my partner on today's video, Factor, comes in. They deliver fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your doorstep. They have a team of gourmet chefs, so that means that when you order from Factor, you also have a team of gourmet chefs. You'll have over 35 different options to choose from every week, including keto, vegetarian, and more, so you can easily plan your meals, no matter your goals. And I'm telling you, every meal has vegetables and they somehow manage to keep those vegetables tender crisp every time. I don't know how they do it. I recently tried this chicken and mushroom tetrazzini, so delicious, and do you know how long that would have taken to make myself and the number of dishes I would have had to wash? That's a no from me, dog. Give me factor instead. They also have breakfast, snacks, and smoothies, so they have you covered for every meal of the day. And there's no prep and no mess, which as an ADHD girly, you know that I love. Head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code Legia 50 free to get 50% off your first factor box and free shipping. That's code Legia 50 free at factor75.com. Thanks factor. Now I'm a strong proponent of the saying, strong opinions loosely held. This quote has been attributed variously to different billionaires and entrepreneurs who use it in a gross way to justify being loud and wrong, move fast and break things. That's not what I mean. You're allowed to have your opinions and to even assert them forcefully, especially for women who are taught to always be quiet and agreeable, have forceful opinions, I'm begging you. But be open-minded to changing those opinions when presented with convincing evidence. That is, I think, the best way to live in this world. It can open you up to friendships you wouldn't otherwise have because of snap judgments made on first impressions. It can keep you curious about the world and all the ways that humans have conceptualized of our existence over the millennia, instead of closed off, curmudgeonly, and convinced that your opinion is the only possible correct one and unwilling to learn new things or to have your mind blown by what could be. Strong opinions loosely held. I think we'd all be better off if everyone was capable of that duality. Have strong opinions, but be open to having your mind changed. If that's you and you're open to hearing about some facts and getting some information that could inform your opinion and your choice on who to vote for, I've curated a playlist of the videos I've made over the last year or so that I feel present some of the most convincing evidence that I hope you'll be open-minded about. I've linked that in the description. For those of you that don't ascribe to that idea or who don't have strong opinions either way, I hear that an appeal to emotion can be an effective approach, much more so than facts and figures. And we know that people often vote on emotions, on vibes. If the vibe's off, they're voting for the other guy or they're not voting at all. And if that's the case for you, allow me to present the best case I can for why the vibes are off for Trump and why the stakes couldn't be higher for you to actually show up and vote for Kamala Harris. Because for me, though I have spent months, years really, studying the ramifications of Trump's first presidency and the potential ramifications of his second, I've learned the facts and the figures, I've looked at the studies and the polling, but through all that information, 
information, the thing I cannot stop thinking about leading up to election day tomorrow is not a thing but a person, Nevaeh Crane, whose story I read about in a ProPublica article that I cannot stop thinking about. I thought about making this video today, my final video before election day, about all the outside influences from billionaires to Russian bots attempting to interfere with our election. And that's a video I'll still probably make, but it's the story of Nevaeh Crane that's been haunting me so much that I had to talk about this today in an attempt to humanize the true cost of you staying home tomorrow, sitting on the couch instead of getting out and voting, tuning out and turning off, looking away because you're angry or you feel disengaged or whatever other reason that's keeping you from locking in and doing this one small act, voting, whatever it is, I can't help but wonder whether hearing about stories from the people here in America, not overseas, not in other countries, right here on US soil, whose lives will be affected or lost, very truly ended by a second Trump presidency, which is all but guaranteed if you stay home tomorrow, especially if you're in a swing state like Michigan or Pennsylvania. One year ago, Nevaeh Crane was an 18 year old living in Southeast Texas. She was happily expecting her first child with her high school sweetheart, intent on building a large family with him. Her and her mother were Christians, opposed to abortion. They felt it was morally wrong. They were unconcerned with what the government did about it, but guided instead by their Christian faith. In October last year, Nevaeh was six months pregnant. On the morning of her baby shower, she awoke with a headache. Soon she became nauseous, vomiting and running a fever. By 3 p.m., Nevaeh and her boyfriend were headed to the emergency room. They sat in the waiting room for four hours with Nevaeh vomiting in a plastic pan that the nurses gave her while they waited. When she was finally seen, a nurse tested her for strep, which came back positive. She was discharged with a prescription for antibiotics and sent home at 9 p.m. that evening. A woman, six months pregnant, vomiting profusely with a fever and abdominal pain, was examined only for strep throat, no doctor evaluated the health of her pregnancy, and she was sent home. A few hours later, Nevaeh was back at the emergency room, a different one this time, where at 4 a.m. an OBGYN noted she had a temperature of 102 degrees, abnormally high pulse, and she rated her abdominal pain a 7 out of 10. A nurse wrapped a sensor belt around Nevaeh's belly to check the fetal heart rate. The baby appeared to be fine. Despite showing clear signs of sepsis, Nevaeh was given two hours of IV fluids, a dose of antibiotics, some Tylenol, and sent home. Her fever hadn't gone down, and her pulse was still abnormally high, as was the fetal heartbeat. Nevaeh could not even walk on her own at this point. She was quiet, breathing heavily, and hunched over in pain as they wheeled her out of the hospital. Back at home, at 7 a.m., Nevaeh began bleeding steadily. By 9 a.m., they were back at the emergency room. Nevaeh was faint. Her lips were white. She was put back on IV antibiotics, and a bedside ultrasound was performed at 9.30. There was no fetal heartbeat detected. By this time, Nevaeh's thighs were covered in blood. Her contractions began at 10 a.m. Her blood pressure began dropping at 10.40. At 11, a second ultrasound was conducted, once again confirming fetal demise. Nevaeh was barely conscious, her lips turning blue. She was finally wheeled into the ICU for an unplanned cesarean section procedure. Doctors quickly realized her condition had become too risky to operate. She had developed a dangerous complication from sepsis known as disseminated intravascular coagulation. She was bleeding internally. Her mother frantically at her side, Nevaeh Crane sat up in her hospital bed. As she did so, old black blood gushed from her nostrils and mouth. She was dead by that afternoon. In Texas, doctors who perform abortions at any point after conception without significant and extensive documentation that there was no fetal heartbeat and the life of the mother was in serious jeopardy, restrictions that are often hard to parse and apply in life-threatening emergency, fast-moving situations, could face life in prison. Life in prison. Texas's Attorney General Ken Paxton has promised to aggressively enforce these laws. Last year, he threatened to prosecute a doctor for performing an abortion despite the fact that the doctor had received court approval to provide an emergency abortion for a woman in Dallas. And let's just pause on that. That means that this doctor, who determined it was medically necessary to perform an emergency abortion, had paused in that emergency to file a petition to a judge to get approval before performing that abortion. And the judge approved, and even still, Ken Paxton sent a letter threatening legal action and claiming that the doctor hadn't proven how precisely the patient's condition was life-threatening. This means that there is truly nothing, nothing, 
doctors can do to protect themselves from prosecution and life in prison if they perform an abortion in the state of Texas. This often includes procedures that are considered necessary and incredibly normal and standard practice in the case of a miscarriage, including something called a DNC. A DNC is an abortion. It is the removal of fetal tissue from inside the uterus. It is medically necessary for the health of the mother after a miscarriage because without one, the dead tissue in her uterus will lead to infection, sepsis, and death. That is long established medical practice. It was the operation that could have saved Nevea's life had they not attempted it far too late. And Nevea's mother, who raised her daughter in her Christian faith, who believed along with her daughter that abortion was morally wrong, who was less concerned with what the government did about it, but more concerned with following her Christian faith, was left with a dead daughter and a dead granddaughter and a feeling of injustice. ProPublica quoted her saying, she was bleeding. Why didn't they do anything to help it along instead of wait for another ultrasound to confirm the baby is dead? I know it sounds selfish, Nevea's mother said, and God knows I would rather have both of them, but if I had to choose, I would have chosen my daughter. I would have chosen my daughter. That is the line from this article that haunts me the most. You never know how you will feel or react in a horrific situation until you're in it, but there's a deep, devastating truth in Nevea's mother's feelings. My Christian faith tells me abortion is wrong and to protect innocent life at all costs. And yet when faced with this impossible, horrible choice that no mother should ever have to be faced with, I would have chosen to save the life of my daughter. I think if anti-choice people were actually faced with that decision, if they were really honest with themselves, if it was their daughter bleeding out in that ICU, they would choose to save their daughter or their mother or their friend because that is the true choice that's being made. Not whether or not there is sanctity in unborn life, but whether or not the life of the person carrying that unborn life matters at all. And while that can include their right generally to choose their own life for themselves, that also means very literally life or death for people getting pregnant in Texas or in any other state where doctors face criminal and civil liability for performing standard procedure life-saving maternal care. And even if you live in a state where that's not the case, you are not immune from its consequences. I live in Minnesota, one of the most progressive states in the country, a safe haven for those seeking maternal care in this region. But I have a loved one who is building a family in Texas who would have to travel nearly 10 hours to get to the nearest abortion clinic should they experience complications in their very wanted pregnancies, who would have to face the same medical system that Nevaeh Crane faced, where doctors are rightfully so terrified of being imprisoned for life that they will diagnose strep throat in an effort to sidestep a dangerous pregnancy altogether and send that pregnant person somewhere else so they don't have to deal with them. And that is terrifying and devastating for anyone who loves anyone being affected by these laws. And make no mistake, this will get worse under a Trump presidency. Recently, Trump has distanced himself from a hardline stance on abortion, acknowledging that abortion bans are incredibly unpopular and he can't get elected on an anti-abortion campaign. But please know that is a ploy to get votes, not a reflection of what he will actually do as president. Trump has boastfully claimed credit for overturning Roe v. Wade. He said that the aftermath of that overturning, the flood of state-level abortion bans, the ones that directly led to the deaths of Nevaeh Crane and numerous others, has been a beautiful thing to watch. He has repeatedly refused to say if he would veto a national abortion ban if it was presented to him as president. He has also attempted to distance himself from Project 2025, but we all know that he is surrounded by, and as president would be surrounded by, the architects of that plan who would largely be pulling the strings because Trump's brain is a mushy old banana. The Project 2025 manifesto mentions abortion 199 times. On page six, it says, the Dobbs decision is just the beginning. Conservatives in the states and in Washington, including in the next conservative administration, should push as hard as possible to protect the unborn in every jurisdiction in America. In particular, the next conservative president should work with Congress to enact the most robust protections for the unborn that Congress will support, while deploying existing federal powers to protect innocent life and vigorously complying with statutory bans on the federal funding of abortion. It calls for the banning of abortion medication. It calls for increased surveillance of those seeking abortion care, which again, typically includes DNCs as part of standard mis carriage care. It calls for allowing religious exemptions under the ACA so providers can elect not to cover contraception or the morning after pill. Have no doubt that Trump and the people he surrounds himself with, who are pulling the levers of power, will move forward with these initiatives. Their attacks on IVF have already made it clear that they are willing to stop at 
at nothing in their attempt to force motherhood and pregnancy on as many people as possible. As Trump said at a recent rally, he'll protect women whether they like it or not. Consider that a threat and take him on his word. Show up and vote for Kamala Harris. Make the effort, if not for yourself and your own rights, then for the rights of your friends or loved ones who will face very real life or death situations in the face of a Trump presidency. But of course, pregnancy is not the only life-threatening risk under a Trump presidency. Trump, Vance, and Project 2025 do not mince terms when it comes to how they plan on treating immigrants in a second Trump presidency. Trump has variously claimed between 2 and 20 million immigrants will be deported, including his political enemies, including people who are here legally. That includes academics, highly skilled workers, people who came here legally under DACA, and people who are here legally as refugees. It also includes the over 4 million children who live in households with at least one parent who is undocumented. Trump and his cronies have promised mass raids and sweeps to deport as many people as possible possible as quickly as possible. The far-ranging impacts of that cannot be overstated. From the economic devastation that removing immigrants would cause to the very personal devastation that would ensue from ripping communities apart. Trump has promised to use a law from the 1700s to pursue his agenda. A legally questionable strategy, but one that was employed to round up Japanese Americans and place them in concentration camps on U.S. soil. But we don't have to look back to World War II to understand the devastation this would cause to everyone, not just undocumented immigrants. It could very well affect you and the community you live in. In Morristown, Tennessee, one April morning in 2018, dozens of ICE agents descended on a meatpacking plant in the eastern Tennessee manufacturing town. Thus began one of the biggest workplace raids of Trump's first administration. Panicked workers fled in every direction, hiding under butcher tables and wedging themselves between beef carcasses. 100 workers, including at least one U.S. citizen and multiple others who had legal authorization to work, were rounded up. Every Latino employee at that plant was arrested, except for one who had hidden in a freezer. The raid in the small town of 30,000 people ground the community to a halt. Kids came home from school to find their houses empty. 500 students were reported missing from school the next day in the wake of the confusion. Community members poured into a standing room only prayer vigil at the school gym. Teachers tried to comfort their students. A traffic jam formed as community members drove up to donate food, clothing, and toys for families of the workers at a local church. Community members noted with dismay how this raid will have ripple effects, not just to migrant families, but to their own children and the larger community. Immigration grew in Tennessee starting in the 90s, and with the growing meth and opioid epidemics, local employers increasingly turned to immigrant labor in meat, poultry, canning, automotive, plastics, and other factories in the area. As increased border rules made it harder and harder to move back and forth for seasonal labor, immigrants increasingly settled down, had children, and spent decades living and working without documentation in these communities. Employers know that workers are unable to enforce their rights in the workplace if they're undocumented, often leading to accidents, lack of protective gear, complete lack of oversight, and the employers evading tax payments and detection. But it was the immigrants that day in Tennessee who faced the consequences, not the companies. One of those affected was a man named Tomas, who worked at the factory for nine years, watching it grow from 10 employees to over 100, mostly on the back of immigrant labor. At the time of the raid, he made $11.50 an hour. His wife, Elizabeth, who had lived in the U.S. for 20 years, made nine dollars an hour as a seamstress. Together, they could afford to rent a house for $700 per month that was large enough to accommodate Elizabeth's six children, three from her previous marriage, whom Tomas raised as his own. Tomas was picked up that day in that ice raid. The workers who ICE picked up at the raid were transferred to a building and slowly processed. The one American citizen was let go, as well as others who could prove they were legally there and those with health concerns. Elizabeth waited outside, but Tomas never came out. Elizabeth's eldest son, Irvin, was 21 and realized immediately that with Tomas gone, he would need to fill in his shoes. Tomas was bussed along with 54 other workers still in detention to Alabama and then to Louisiana. In the aftermath of the raid, one woman who had lived in Tennessee her whole life said, you know, I voted for Trump, but I never imagined that this would be the impact of that. In February 2023, five years after the raid, the affected families won a class action settlement that provided over $1 million to affected workers due to overly harsh treatment, excessive force, unlawful arrest, and illegal targeting of Latino workers. That's a million dollars from ICE, so paid for by taxpayer money, on top of the taxpayer money necessary to carry out mass raids and process large amounts of people. Carrying out the 1 million deportations per year that J.D. Vance has called for would cost nearly $1 trillion over the next decade. On top of that, mass Mass deportations would shrink the GDP by up to 7%. Tax collection would fall as undocumented immigrants contributed nearly $100 billion in federal, state, and local taxes in 2022 alone. 5% of the workforce would be wiped out. 
Immigrants also contribute to the economy through demand for goods and services. And according to their rhetoric, Trump and Vance would not stop at undocumented workers. Vance has repeatedly said that the Haitian immigrants living in Springfield, Ohio, the ones falsely accused of eating pets, should be removed even though they were encouraged to come and are here legally. Vance claims that the law under which they are legally here is illegitimate, which is a little preview of what's to come in a second Trump presidency. Not only will those here without documents be targeted, so too will legal immigrants whose status will be questioned by delegitimizing the laws they entered legally under. The consequences of this would be wide-reaching and devastating, not just for the economy, but for communities across the country. Again, I am haunted by that woman in Tennessee who said she voted for Trump, but never imagined this would be the impact of that. You may not be undocumented, but your neighbors, coworkers, and members of your community, your children's friends at school, they might be, or their parents might be. You might be an immigrant who thinks you're here legally, but they may find a way to revoke that status. Or you may be profiled and caught up in the dragnet even if you were born and raised here. This is the very real impact of you not showing up to vote tomorrow. Do not let frustration with the system, election fatigue, or apathy prevent you from showing up. The consequences of that inaction will be far-reaching and unpredictable. In March 2022, Karen, a mother of two children, was driving her daughter Jessie around the streets of their hometown in Austin, Texas, when Jessie, just 10 years old, tearfully asked her mother from the back seat, am I going to die? When Karen asked Jessie why she would say that, Jessie responded, because everybody here hates me. That was the moment Karen knew she needed to move her family out of Texas. Karen had been fighting anti-trans laws in Texas for over three years at that point, attempting to protect Jesse, who is trans, from laws that would restrict her rights, especially as she approached puberty, a pivotal time for young trans people who are seeking gender-affirming care, care that is broadly approved of and supported by major U.S. and international medical associations and experts. Studies have found that gender-affirming care is associated with 40% lower odds of depression and self-harm. Trans youth are incredibly high risk of suicide, especially when experiencing social stigma or lack of access to resources. 13 anti-trans youth bills were filed in Texas in 2021, with more going into effect since then. In 2022, Governor Greg Abbott directed the state's Family Protection Services to investigate parents who provide their trans children with gender-affirming care. That means that Karen and her husband would be subject to CPS investigation and potential civil or criminal penalty should they provide their child with appropriate, doctor-approved care as she aged into puberty. The family's relocation to Portland, Oregon meant that Jesse and her parents could follow the advice of Jesse's doctors as well as Jesse's own wishes as she grew up and into her identity. Karen's family is one of many who left Texas and other conservative states for the well-being of their children. Many others want to move but can't due to work or family obligations or the high cost of out-of-state relocation, a cost that is inaccessible for many families. Nationally, 662 anti-trans bills have been introduced as of 2024, with 45 passed and 125 still active. That includes 80 national anti-trans bills and 60 in Oklahoma alone, the most active state at the moment. Again, this is not limited to Southern and conservative states. Like I said, there are 80 national anti-trans bills that have been introduced. And in Minnesota, again, a liberal bastion of the North, 20 have been introduced. A slim Democratic majority is the only thing standing in the way of anti-trans bills becoming law in one of the most liberal states in the country. Which is why if you stay home, you are also sitting out important local elections that will affect you every day in ways that you likely cannot predict now. Project 2025 calls for a ban on transgender individuals from serving in the military and a ban on Medicare covering gender reassignment surgery. It says that Title VII should not bar employers from firing people for being homosexual or transgender. And it condemns the suffering of children due to the toxic normalization of transgenderism. Trump has promised to undo a Biden administration policy that gives transgender students protection under Title IX. He has vowed to cut federal funding to schools promoting transgender insanity. And the Trump campaign has spent millions of dollars on anti-trans ads, making it perfectly crystal fucking clear that under a second Trump administration, the federal government, as well as the states, would be empowered to pass bills that will allow discrimination against LGBTQ folks, trans and non-trans alike, from the workplace to the schoolyard and everywhere in between. If you do not show up to vote tomorrow, you are risking a very real scenario where employers will be emboldened to discriminate against you or your loved ones or your neighbors, where hate towards the LGBTQ community will be encouraged, and where trans youth suicide rates will increase under growing threat of discrimination and lack of access to medically necessary care. This is the effect of your apathy or your single issue or protest vote for a third party candidate. These are the real consequences. 
Pregnant people will die painful, horrific, completely avoidable deaths. Immigrants, whether here legally or not, will face increasing violence and threat of deportation and racial profiling. Trans kids will die. That is what's at stake. And there is one single easy thing you can do in the next 24 hours to ensure that doesn't happen. You can shut down, turn away, ignore this reality. You can pretend to take the moral high ground by saying your principles require you not to vote or to vote third party because you deserve to vote for a candidate who you agree with more, like Jill Stein, who is not the candidate you think she is, and a vote for her is not the morally superior choice you think it is. Please do a Google before wasting your vote on her. Or you can take the realistic, pragmatic, harm reduction approach. You can do it begrudgingly. You can do it unhappily, but you can do it anyway, knowing that you showed up in the face of very real potential fascist tyranny that will affect everyone around you and the fabric of not only US society, but global society. And you chose to act, to do something, to prevent that future, to instead place a vote in favor of a world where women, where LGBTQ folks, where immigrants and minority communities actually have a fighting chance for survival. Please vote. If you need more information about your polling place, what's on your ballot or how to vote, go to IWillVote.com. Comment below with your voting plan if you haven't voted yet. I'm going to my polling place tomorrow on election day to vote for Kamala Harris, and I implore you to do the same. I'll be back on Wednesday for a recap of election day. And until then, please don't turn away. Please show up. Please vote. If you want ad-free and uncensored versions of these videos, join me over on Patreon at patreon.com slash Miller. Thank you to my multi-platinum patrons, Rex, T, Latranger Lucas, Joshua Cole, Thomas Johnson, Anthony Giles, Tay, and Brett Piantek. Generosity makes this channel what it is, so thank you. And if you like this episode, you'll like my episode from last week, laying out that yes, Trump is, in fact, a fascist. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye.